Well, I'm going to be talking uh, about some basic components of fidelity, and uh, I'm going to ask four questions, or talk about four questions. Um, those questions are, what is fidelity, which all of you, I think, already know that one, but uh, what is fidelity? Why do we strive to achieve fidelity? Can we achieve fidelity? And what are the factors that are, um, are associated with fidelity? So quickly, fidelity basically is implementing those, those core components, those components of the program that were developed or designed and tested. There are at least four primary components of fidelity. Um, adherence is just implementing all of the core components, core content, and Amy kind of discussed that in, in her presentation. Dosage is another major of fidelity, is the frequency. Uh, are you doing the number of sessions that were intended um, at the required uh, time period? If you have 15 sessions and they're supposed to be 50 minutes, is that happening? Also, uh, quality of program delivery. Some programs have specific methods or techniques that are prescribed. So if it's an interactive program, are you doing those interactive methods? And then another measure is participant responsiveness. Uh, are the participants actually uh, responsive to the program? Do they think the program is meeting their needs? Is it high quality? Are they enthusiastic about the program? Program fidelity is important because, first of all, it, it allows you to assess and improve the quality of your program as you go along. So you're always wanting to know what, where you can make changes or fine tune the program. Uh, it allows you to know what is being implemented, where your strengths, where are your weaknesses, where there are weaknesses. You may need to do, address them through more training in TA, or it may not even be a training issue. It may be a capacity issue that you have to address in your own organization. So it allows you to fine tune the program as you go along. Also, it's important to understand fidelity because of the association between the program and the outcomes. When I began looking at programs, when there was a program failure, I always thought it was a failure of the theory behind the program. My very first question now is always, was the program implemented with enough fidelity to achieve results? Um, and, you know, when you do fidelity analyses and you do it in conjunction with an outcome evaluation, you can learn many other things. You can learn about the thresholds that are needed in implementing a program. Maybe every program doesn't have to be implemented with 100% fidelity. We already know that for the most part we don't achieve that level of fidelity. But is there a certain level that you do have to achieve in order to to gain outcomes. And then if you have made modifications, how do those modifications impact the outcomes? Okay, these are some studies um, that show the importance of fidelity, and I've just taken meta-analyses uh, to show this. In a study of 143 drug programs, well-implemented programs achieved effect sizes 0.34 greater than poorly implemented programs. Uh, in another one, implementation quality made the largest contribution of any variable to effect size. That's from some of Mark Lipsy's work. That was in some of the earlier work. I think in some later stuff it made maybe the second largest contribution. In 76% of 59 studies, positive relationship between implementation and at least half of all program outcomes. The next two meta-analyses show effect sizes with programs that were monitored. And the assumption here being that if you're monitoring a program, you're also achieving higher fidelity to the program. And in these, we find that uh, there was an achievement of effect sizes three times larger with monitoring than those that were not monitored. And then among 14 anti-bullying programs, those that monitored implementation obtained twice the mean effects on bullying and victimization than those that did not monitor implementation. Can we achieve fidelity? Uh, this is from school-based programs, some studies, and it shows it's quite difficult to achieve fidelity. Um, 
in at least one study, only 19% of school districts implemented an evidence-based curriculum with fidelity, and up to 81% of the activities were omitted. Denise Godfordson did a study of delinquency prevention, and she found that only one half of drug programs and a quarter of mentoring programs were implemented with, with the right dosage requirements and one half taught with recommended methods of instruction. So it can be difficult, but not impossible. Um, we, we've done some projects where we've implemented all of the blueprint programs, and I'm just gonna use one of the blueprint programs as an example, because we've implemented this one in more sites nationwide. The Life, Gil Botvin's Life Skills Training Program. Uh, we implemented in 105 sites, over 400 schools. In conjunction with the program developer, we provided training and technical assistance. We provided all of the curriculum materials. Um, we did monitoring and provided feedback to those sites. Now we started uh, choosing the sites and, and trying to do a little bit of work to prepare sites. Our, I think our, our efforts were fairly minimal, but it's what we could do, it's what we had the capacity to do in a very large project. Um, we started with the application, and in the, our applications, we asked about their need for the program, and had they done any type of planning up front, because I, it was stated earlier, we didn't want someone just applying for the grant. We wanted to know that they actually had maybe assessed their need and they really wanted this program or a particular program that met that need. We looked at the type of commitment that they had at their site and, and for life skills training, we asked for an implementation plan right up front because we didn't want the site starting to think about implementation after the grant and in the year of implementation when school started and you know trying to develop that plan at the last minute. We wanted them to give thought to it right up front. Then we followed up with feasibility visits. So we went to each site and uh, we presented the programs. And what we did there is we, we asked that key players be there. Of course, the people who wrote the applications were there, but we wanted a principal from every school that was gonna implement to be there. And we actually mandated that because if you don't have the support from your top administrators, it's very likely that your implementation's gonna fail because they're not gonna be supportive of the program in all of the different capacity ways that they need to be supportive of. So we mandated that they be there. Uh, we wanted all teachers to be there that would implement. We could never get that. So we also mandated that at least one teacher from every school that was gonna implement be at that meeting. Because we felt like we could bridge the gap, that kind of information gap uh, between the administrators and the teachers. If, at least if a teacher was there, they could take information back to other people, to other teachers. We monitored implementation by conducting site visits. We went one time during the period that they were doing life skills training. During those site visits, we met with the teachers, the coordinators, um, we met with principals, even though again, principals aren't always the most knowledgeable about what the program is. But again, we felt like if we met with them, we're providing them with information and that could build their support because oftentimes they would bring their teachers in to that meeting and everybody would meet together and, and the principals could hear what the issues were at that site. We did uh, teacher and coordinator surveys and the hub of our monitoring was classroom observations. So we contracted with local observers. We, you know, we preferred to have retired school teachers, people who wanted to stay involved in the school system, but um, there were any number of people that could do this job. Uh, we contracted with them to actually go in and just sort of do a random assessment of, of the classes that were being done. So in year one, we would get four observations of every teacher. And there's a checklist that we follow that, that the designer has developed. Um, that checklist is geared to every lesson and it just has all of the major points and objectives of, in the lesson. So if a teacher implements five of the 10 major points or objectives of that lesson, they have an implementation score of 50%. And then we average that score across the site to get an implementation score. And then we did feedback reports. 
Uh, our adherence uh, on all four of the measures is, is very high. We, on adherence, it's 86 percent, 71, 86 percent of the teachers taught, or I'm sorry, not, the teachers taught 86 percent of the core content of the lesson. 71 percent of the teachers taught all of the lessons. And life skills training uses these interactive methods uh, of teaching. It's not all just standing up and lecturing. And there's, while there's no standard for how much of that needs to be delivered, you can see that, that there's an ample amount with about 70% of the time being spent in these more interactive types of methods. And then 89% of the students participated in LST activities. We found that uh, associated with uh, fidelity uh, are these factors that we've already been talking about all day. We've, we've heard them. There are frameworks that people have developed around these, including Karen. Um, some of the, this is on, on both LST and our other violence project uh, of where we have replicated eight of the other blueprint programs are on the right. But just specifically staying with life skills training, we found that program characteristics were very important. Uh, our coordinators told us basically that some of their major issues were around time, cost, and then the inflexibility. The time had to do with um, taking away from statewide testing, basically, taking away from core curriculum and statewide testing. You're going to find time is an issue through all of these domains. It even came up. Uh, when we didn't even ask about it, within the scale, time would still come up as a major issue. Uh, cost of workbooks, cost of training, cost of subs is a problem in school-based programs. And then our coordinators told us that, you know, some of the teachers at least uh, wanted the flexibility to either take away from the lessons or to add to them. So they, they did want that flexibility. Um, also, for life skills training, we found that having parent awareness was associated with fidelity and also having a strong champion at, at, um, at each of the, the school districts. One that's not quite so easily explainable is under the implementation factors. Uh, we found that teachers that were actually more supportive of the program were less likely to use the interactive methods. That's a little difficult to explain, but let me talk about the next one, too, the student behavior. We also found that students who were more well-behaved in the classroom, in those situations, teachers were more likely to use interactive methods, and they're more likely to adhere to the program. So, you know, it, it speaks to bringing in some of these programs that are very interactive in nature. There may be more that needs to be done than just bringing in that specific program. We may need to, to do some other training around classroom management strategies to prepare teachers for these programs because we have teachers that are supportive of the program, but they're afraid to do the interactive. They're afraid of losing control of their class. Uh, in these activities, and it's sometimes there. There's just space limitations. They're in a gym where you just can't do the interactive activities. Um, I've put up here. LST has specific fidelity guidelines. So their guidelines are to teach the full sequence, the full scope and sequence of the LST curriculum. So you have to teach all of the lessons and in the order. Um, uh, that's made because actually lessons are generally built in a sequential manner where certain concepts and skills are taught and they're built upon one another from lesson to lesson. So you can't just randomly select lessons out. You need to teach at least one time per week for consecutive weeks until all the units are taught. Use the interactive teaching methods and teach the booster sessions. And they also say they ask that the curriculum not be combined or integrated with other prevention or core curriculum lessons. Uh, and they suggest, you can see here, a favorite activity or lesson may seem congruent with LST, but in actuality may compromise the effectiveness of the program or contradict its theory and design. So just to quickly summarize, uh, fidelity is important. Uh, it's very important to the outcomes. 
And if we want to attain fidelity, I think it's very important to put into place a monitoring and feedback system. Uh, again, that, that feedback system is going to identify program drift, allow you to, to make changes as you go along. Uh, it's going to improve the capacity of your organization to implement the program well. And then also, don't compromise the essential core of the program. We know what has worked in the evaluation, and uh, you, if you're going to do anything, uh, any type of modifications, you really need to understand what that core of the program is and not deviate from the core and you know, get insight from the developer of the program to do so. Thank you.